the committee here. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our meeting of the School Building Committee. Today is Thursday, June 8, 2023. Uh, our first item of business is the approval of the May 25, 2023 meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Mary, thank you. Is there a second? Okay, yeah, thank you, Tony. Seconds it. Are there any corrections to the May 25 minutes? Okay, seeing none or hearing none, then all in favor of approving the, the May 25 minutes, please uh, indicate your approval. Any, Aye. Thank you, Chris. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay. Uh, that brings us to the opportunity for public input. Is there anybody from the public that would like to address the committee? None, we'll move on uh, to a superintendent update. Peter. Good evening or good afternoon, everybody. Um, so just another exciting week, a uh, couple of weeks since the last time we met. Uh, MES is actually just a regular school with regular kind of events going on. And I mean that in just a wonderful sense that they've had like concerts and assemblies. Uh, we had a couple of uh, concerts as one tonight. Uh, there was a curriculum night. Uh, and so we're seeing kind of the return of these iconic events, uh, but in an amazing space. So we're getting to test drive uh, and really feel the edges of every nook and cranny, including our auditorium in the gymnasium space. And it is just amazing. Uh, so uh, again, just kudos and, and thank you to all who have helped us. Uh, we're in our uh, eighth week. Uh, and the school, even though we're heading into a summer break, feels like it's in full tilt mode. So I want to shout out to my uh, admin team and our teachers and staff members and certainly the students uh, who are taking advantage of each and every day. I had an opportunity to visit a couple of classrooms uh, and just had uh, many great conversations with kids. And as we were thinking about goals for the future, I asked them, uh, what is what is best about uh, Mansfield Elementary School? And uh, they just continue to talk about the building, the space, the light, the windows. Uh, and eventually I had to kind of nudge them into other areas, but they wanted to talk about the building because they truly are inspired. Uh, one particular evening, uh, we uh, had a uh, thunderstorm kind of roll in and students were standing by windows, just watching this amazing storm front kind of roll in off the hills. Uh, and it was just, it was gorgeous. It was just yet another kind of example of uh, how that space uh, just uh, allows people to uh, connect with nature, uh, the outside and, and the changing light. So very, very exciting about that. Um, we are heading into our big celebration, so I know Margaret is listening and wants me to uh, again reach out and, and uh, encourage all school building committee members to attend our ribbon cutting uh, 930 with a 940 uh, start time uh, come a little earlier for parking. Uh, we uh, will have um, uh, invited guests and, and dignitaries and speakers. Um, all the school building committee members, we would like you to be a part of the actual official ribbon cutting. Uh, Steve's uh, daughter is going to be uh, helping with the big novelty scissors. Uh, and so we would like the school building committee to stand behind our representative group of kids and Thunder the Tiger, along with the lieutenant governor and uh, um, perhaps the governor. Uh, and we'll, we'll have that uh, final uh, moment where we officially open Mansfield Elementary School. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll conclude that ceremony on Friday with tours. So please stick around. The more that uh, joins the tours and, and talks about the building and answers questions, I think the better. Uh, and then Saturday is our public facing community celebration that starts at 12 noon. We'll have uh, food trucks and vendors and uh, town agencies and uh, civic partners with tables that are set up outside. There'll be self-guided tours throughout the building. Uh, and then we have Echo Uganda, a uh, Mansfield family band uh, providing live music 
And so we're really encouraging people to kind of hang out and play and enjoy the day with us. Um, and so thank you. Uh, it, it continues to be a great honor uh, to see this space actualized and, and open. Questions for Peter? I don't know if Peter is the right one to give us an update on how the dishwashers sorting uh, out. I think we can talk about that at length. I don't know if, uh, if I don't have an update, but I I see Bill. I think was on the call at one point, uh, and so I'll defer to Bill. Thank you. Okay. If there's nothing else, um, and I'm sure Peter can weigh in as we um, talk about some of the other uh, items later. Um, I think then we can move on to the updates from um, contractor architect OPM. So, um, Randy, do you want to jump in here and just kind of sure. move through the list, and then that way, if there's additional questions, it's a it's a little more structured. Um, so the um, just to First off, um, I had sent the, the summary spreadsheet out to the school building committee members. Um, please let me know if there's any issues doing the spreadsheet or the, any other um, data points or, or anything like that that um, would be helpful when we're sort of in between meetings um, to help keep you abreast of what's going on on the sort of the day to day as things come in. Um, just running through uh, those larger items that have been discussed at the last couple of meetings. Um, in no, in no particular order. Uh, the asphalt patchwork um, that's scheduled to be uh, resolved once school is out. Um, Newfield has their subcontractor scheduled for June 22nd, um, as well as another contractor for the other portion of the work also on June 22nd. Um, the dishwasher that uh, we just mentioned. So there was a uh, site meeting between the food service designer the uh, food service installer and the dishwasher manufacturer on Monday of this week to review not just the dishwasher, but uh, any other items that came up. I believe Bill and uh, Mariah, the food service director, were also there so, so that nothing got missed in the, uh, in the conversations. Uh, with regard to the dishwasher, uh, a memo just came out, uh, I want to say an hour ago or something like that, from the food service designer after they were coordinating with the actual manufacturer of the dishwasher. Um, and there are basically two components that were causing some of the issues. Um, one, on the inlet side of things, where the tray is going into the dishwasher, there was a, uh, a faucet uh, component that needed to be installed beneath, but it was installed above, and that was impacting some of the way the trays went in. Um, so that item was flagged. And then... Um, Sorry, Adam, could, could you repeat what you just said? I didn't, I didn't quite hear that. Oh, something. Uh, uh, something was installed on... Right, so there was a component of the, the sink that they kind of spray things off before, you know, get the worst of it off before it goes in the dishwasher. That component, there was a, I think it was like a faucet valve or something was supposed to be below the surface. And instead it was accidentally installed above. So it was knocking some of the trays before they went into the dishwasher. So that needs to be relocated. And then on the outlet side of things, which was the major focal point for the, um, for the food service staff, uh, the, the manufacturer provided one type of conveyor system, um, but it needs to be a different type to facilitate the trays getting moved through. So the manufacturer is uh, drawing up those uh, shop drawings and coordinating with the food service designer um, to get that component replaced. And between those two, um, it appears that should solve all the issues with the dishwasher, or namely something went wrong, the dishwasher would have given an error and full stop all service because something was amiss along the chain. Uh, the other component that was uh, talked about was the um, roll-up door, the pass-through roll-up door, which is before you get to the dishwasher, the trays come in through the, the, the pass-through window there. Um, and it was supposed to have uh, assisted lift, lifting, you know, like a spring or a counterweight system in the rails. So that way it's not very heavy to lift. Um, apparently there was some issue with the, uh, with that mechanism, which is why it was extremely difficult. Um, so the vendor, uh, I'm sorry, the manufacturer has taken it back and is, is working on those components in the shop. Um, and we'll, we'll bring it back out to the site and reinstall or alternatively, if it can't be tensioned to such a way where it's actually liftable based on the design configuration, uh, then the food service vendor or food service designer 
um, will assist with uh, um, picking out an alternative to, to fit the system, whether it's a, an outdoor lift or, uh, or something to that effect where it's not people reaching over and having this heavy door that they're trying to lift from behind the, uh, the sinks. Uh, the last component on the kitchen that was uh, targeted was the uh, refrigerator door. One of the locks wasn't working. Um, I don't know if someone from Newfield uh, is on the line that can speak to that. I believe that the, the food service installer was supposed to bring some of the locks and, and just replace it at that meeting on Monday, but I'm not sure if that occurred or if they still need the components. Uh, Steve or Brian, or I don't know if Ben is on, do you know? Ben sent me an email this morning that said that the uh, lock for the kitchen had been fixed and it's okay. all set. All right, so that, that did occur. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that was the last component on the, on the kitchen that was being tracked in terms of the equipment, um, things of that nature. Um, for the lighting, um, there have been some issues with- oh, oh, uh, you have a good question oh, before yeah, you move yeah. on? Question on the kitchen? I do. So I, I appreciate all that information about what was um, not installed correctly or where there were errors. But of course, the bottom line is, how are things working? <laughs> are we still in a place where we're needing to use disposable um, trays and things in order to make up for this problem? And when can we expect to see I would imagine we're not going to see a change in that in the next couple of weeks. So where do we sit today, I guess, is my question. Jeff, you might you were talking with Dick. Do you have a sense of what the timelines are? No, it sounds to me like um, they're coming up with a different roller system. So they just need to go through the process of making sure that when the shop drawings come through that we've thought about everything like anything that might be in the way or anything that might need to be adjusted so it's just one last blessing before they come in and yank that section out and replace it with a different uh motorized roller system instead of the there's like teeth and an arm that grabs a the, the grid of the plastic tray and that's moving not at the rate where the next tray comes at it. So that was the issue. So that are going to do a roller, motorized roller pass through like in the beginning of the dishwasher. So I will be on top of it. I'll make sure that things are moving as fast as they can. So. Here. Uh, and just uh, so you know, uh, we are using the uh, reusable trays. I, uh, it, you know, we offset that from time to time with the paper disposable. We're doing our best. Uh, when the dishwasher jams or when we're not unable to do it if, or if we're uh, short staff, uh, it, it just takes a lot. And so Mariah and her team are doing their best to honor the sustainable vision of uh, the infrastructure and, and design, but also have to just manage the bottom line of getting lunches out uh, in a timely fashion. Um, um, Randy, may I? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Um, who does pay for these kinds of things? I mean, this whole thing sounds like it's getting a significant redesign. In the meantime, we've been buying uh, presumably thousands of trays over time um, and other other things that we hadn't counted on. Um, what's happening budget-wise with that, with all those? I mean, it's my, uh, my intention to make sure that this was this these attachments to this dishwasher this is all part of the dishwasher so uh champion should step up and it's and just replace this roller unit that's attached to the dishwasher because the whole thing is designed um through them and it's part of the dishwasher so that's my expectation the things like the uh moving the hose bib for the spray off thing um, that I believe uh, Newfield will have to speak to that, but I'm expecting since it was shown in the specs and drawings to be under and not over that that should probably be uh, moved. And then the door, hopefully the counterweights and the tensioning of that is 
dealt with at the factory. And when that comes back in, that should be ready to go. So I'm not expecting any charges, but we'll see. Thank you. And uh, Peter, do you have a sense of how much this trays are costing us? Another, whatever other. I, I don't, but I, I'll say that, uh, you know, this is, uh, these are materials and, and items that we have on hand. Uh, certainly we're using more than what we would typically uh, use, but it's um, it's something that we would have on stock uh, regardless, because at any given moment, if the dishwasher were to fail, we need a backup plan to have paper products on hand in order to make sure breakfast and lunch is served. Okay, thanks. Okay, Adam, then we're gonna go on to the light. Yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep going through. Um, on some of the lighting, there has uh, been some issues that have cropped up with the outdoor lights and some of the timing. They worked for a while and then all of a sudden stopped in terms of when they come on and come off. Um, and similarly, there are some issues with some of the classroom lighting programming. Um, so uh, we have a meeting today where uh, the vendors are going to be coming back out to um, review those and fix that issue. They've, there's been some issues with that vendor coming back out and, and fixing it. Uh, Newfield's aware of that. They've been reaching out but couldn't get a hold of them and there hasn't been any progress there. So that's why there has been a, a warranty letter issued a new field so they can pass it along to the vendor to motivate them uh, to come back out to the site to resolve the lighting control issues. Uh, next item. Question, question from, question. Oh, question. Yeah, it's hard to see with all the things, so I'll just interrupt. Yeah, hi Adam. Um, just wondering the lighting control, is this something that uh, going forward will need to be adjusted? Like, is it like a timer type deal where Bill or Alan will need to know how to uh, do this or is this always a vendor that would need to come out to make these adjustments. Uh, Bill, that might be for you what your proclivity is with the lighting controls. No, it, it should not be any kind of adjustment. Once these are working properly, it should follow the uh, sunrise and sunset um, of the day. Um, and it won't matter whether it's wintertime, springtime or whatever, it should adjust itself so that the lights are on for a certain time and, and off. Um, there won't be any settings. Once we get it working right, it won't have to do any more than let it run. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the uh, mechanical systems, um, yeah, we had a meeting today about uh, commissioning and uh, review of those items. So there has been this past week, some of the thermostats were rewired. Uh, that appeared to be the, the main driving factor with some of the heat pump issues coming on and off. Um, so there are two, um, basically two tacks moving forward. A, they've done some trend logging to confirm that what was done at the thermostats actually has resolved the issue. Um, and B, some additional um, uh, logging will be reviewed at the heat pumps to a, confirm that the, the thermostats were actually the issue, and B, resolve any other items that are coming through from the heat pumps. Basically, the, the whistling and the, the cold temperatures that have been reported by uh, Rich Weil and others uh, appeared to be from some of the, the thermostats going wildly vacillating back and forth by like 14 degrees. So it, for lack of a better term, it was uh, freaking out the heat pumps and causing them to go into faults and shut down for to preserve the mechanics of the issue. So that there has been some initial uh, work done there. There still needs to be some follow-up work and the controls manufacturer um, is getting their technician back out to confirm, but there's progress being made on that front as well, um, all tied to the thermostats. Um, the water pumps where we had that issue with the domestic uh, a little while back, um, both pumps are up and running. Um, the uh, the frequency drive, the variable frequency drive that was the issue uh, is still with the vendor. They're gonna be providing the town with a new one um, as well as extending their warranty uh, to reflect the fact that they had a, a problem with their first variable frequency drive. Um, so once the town receives that, uh, that new VFD to serve as the spare, 
um, that should close out that issue. But as of now, there's no operational issues with the water pumps. For the retention basin, um, there was a CCD issued by TSKP um, yesterday, is the seventh, yes, yesterday, um, to reflect the work that needs to occur at the pond. And that was given, I'm sorry, not the pond, the retention basin and some of the rain gardens uh, to uh, address the, the siltation and, and uh, the lack of drainage at those areas. I would say, so, hey, hey, Adam, can you make a correction on that? Uh, the CCD was was given to us like after five thirty six o'clock last night. Oh yeah, so we, we couldn't engage with anybody until this morning. Yep, no, I, I agree with that. Yep, it came right. through at the end of the day. Absolutely. Okay, so saying it yesterday, it's like that we've been sitting on it for a day. Um, we've got a meeting with um, we've got a meeting with the, with the psych guy tomorrow morning in our office to run through that CCD and how best to react to it. And we'll keep you posted as, as the prosecution and the results of that. Understood, yes. Um, can, I, can I ask a question? What is the CCP? Oh, CCD. What? What is That's it? A, Adam, do you wanna explain a CCD? Yes, yeah, so uh, CCD is a construction change directive. Um, so effectively it's a, it's a mechanism to establish work that a contractual mechanism to establish the work that needs to occur uh, without having agreed upon um, the, the basically the owner and the contractor having agreed upon what the um, financial implications are. Uh, currently, there has been communications between the design team and Newfield about the cause of why the pond isn't draining, why the retention basin isn't draining. Um, so the, the point of the CCD is to get the solution underway without having to wait for everyone to you know, agree upon what the dollar value is um, and who owns that scope of work. Um, so the, the way it would eventually lead to is if it was found and determined that uh, money is owed to Newfield because it was out of contract, then it would be, it would turn into a PCO and then a change order like you've seen. Um, if it was determined that it wasn't, then it would just be the construction change directive would proceed as what the work is, is uh, required. Anything else on the retention basin? I'm sorry, but I didn't understand where we are at, actually. Are we just still consulting or have we got some solutions that we're working on? The, the solutions have been uh, designed, identified and given to Newfield to implement. And what so, are those solutions? Uh, Richard, We've got to um, remove the existing uh, topsoil three solution um, uh, mix, which is I think the first 12 inches. We need to remove any siltation that has encroached underneath that mat. They need us to scarify to a depth of three feet um, be below the existing subgrade to, to eliminate any alleged overcompaction that they are speaking of. Um, grade that all off, replace the mulch or topsoil three mix, and it's should be done. That's the bottom of the pond. The sides of the pond, they want to make sure that we can get those slopes established so we don't have any erosion on those slopes that would cause any siltation um, infiltration to the bottom of that pond. I think Fuss and O'Neill laid out a, I would consider a, a very systematic resolution that they think would work. So we're, we're looking, we're meeting with the site guy tomorrow and running through that in our office to make sure that we understand the means and methods at which it should be installed or corrected or whatever. I'd just like to make one quick comment that I did read um, that report and I'm honestly really impressed with how Steve, how familiar Steve is with all the different things that are noted in it. So I think uh, if we can make those things happen, we're in good shape. And we maybe should change the name from a, a, just to being a pond. Maybe then we would be more satisfied with what we've got. 
not intended to be a pun. <laughs> what 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 I don't understand is why will these changes be affect a permanent solution? Because if you've got silt raining into the pond, clogging up the drainage, uh, the only thing I've heard you say that would stop that from happening is changing the angles of the banks. Um, do you think the the it is the erosion of the bank that has caused this problem? The 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 site engineer, civil engineer, has said that that's partly the cause of the issue is the erosion of the banks and the, what they would consider the lack of stabilization of the banks um, when they were installed and what we call is over compaction, which we felt we follow the guidelines of the specifications and the reviews of Fuss and O'Neill with the low impact, low profile um, dozers that were used. Um, but that case, again, we're going to review it all with the, with the site contractor tomorrow. Brian, uh, what time are we meeting with him? Uh, 10 o'clock. So we hope to have a comfort factor that they know what they need to do. And we acknowledge that approach and schedule the work. And I would assume that we would do it when the kids get out. Thank you. Attention Basin. Uh, next item. Um, was Can I pause just for a second? I'm sorry. I was having trouble finding my unmute button. So um, I have reviewed um, and discussed at quite some length with both Fussin O'Neill and Richter and Segan, who prepare the memos that are attached to the CCD. This is CCD 17. And um, uh, also I asked uh, Ron Bomingen, who is with Fussin O'Neill, to have a discussion with Derek Delay, town engineer. And I know they had a meeting on site to review um, what they thought was happening with the pond and uh, a strategy for uh, uh, correcting it. And so I think everybody's on board from Derek to Ron to Gary Guimond of uh, Victor and Segan that this is the strategy that should be taken. Um, yes, yes, the soils need to be removed. However, I believe the memo also says that trees that are planted can remain. I think they've said that you can work around the trees in a four foot diameter and you can leave the soils that are there. Yeah, four, six feet diameter. Yeah. So I think the direction is clear. Obviously, if there are any questions after Newfield gets into it with their site subcontractor, they can reach out to us or to our sub consultants to clarify anything. But it's a very simple two page, uh, a one page memo from. Richter and Segan and a one page memo from Fusson O'Neill. Who's going to witness the um, infiltration after it's been scarified? That's a good question. Um, so, who has been doing that in the past? Is it Westcott and Sampson? No, if they're Fuston O'Neill, and that's really Richard. That's what happened the last time. Tom from Fuston O'Neill was out there witnessing the operations as it was going in, and at no point in time were we told that we were doing any overcompaction. So I think it's got to be Fuston O'Neill and Richter Segan, um, bird dog, and it along with us. You know, making sure that we didn't miss any steps. Okay. Yep, no, I'll communicate that with them as well. All right. And if there's any compaction testing or anything like that that's called for in the spec for this item, then that should be coordinated with IMTL, our testing agency as well. Okay. Hope it stays dry for the next few weeks. Hmm. Anything else in the basin? 
Okay. Uh, the cafeteria acoustics um, uh, email just came through um, a little bit ago uh, from Jeff and the acoustician indicating that uh, there does appear to be some reverberation. Additional components could assist. Um, uh, they included a proposal to look at the site and pro provide recommendations for additional uh, elements, but be quite frankly, that email just came through. So we're still looking at that um, and need to review that for next steps moving forward. Uh, just a quick question on, on that, Adam. Um, I know it's fresh information. Maybe you haven't really had a chance to look at it super closely, but have we ruled in or ruled out um, and any new information, I guess, on the working hypothesis from the last meeting about the painting issue and the pores? Is that still a possibility or no? I defer to Jeff or Richard on that one. Yeah, the proposal <clears throat> includes uh, Mark Reber actually taking a closer inspection of that and reviewing it. I tried to take a bunch of photos close up and I couldn't really tell, but it is clear in our spec and in the manufacturer's recommendations for those panels that there is a procedure and there's a way of painting it. I did find a couple of photos. Um, so anyway, we'll we'll put all this together once Mark gets out there and he's gonna review a lot of different things should you approve this, uh, his proposal. Uh, and then I think we'll uncover some truths. Thank you. Uh, the stone wall cap. Um, this is an item where there's the, uh, the there's basically two PCOs outstanding for this. One is a potential uh, credit for the cap, um, where uh, there was some uh, requested clarification and a potential increase in that submitted to Newfield, as well as uh, I believe Jeff, you had um, your local Mason contact that was make, was going to be providing a potential proposal. Um, I haven't seen anything on that, so I don't know if you have more data for the committee. Uh, no further, but I do believe we had a discussion. Um, I don't think it was this meeting, but maybe it was the OAC meeting where uh, I was getting correspondence from him during the meeting. And it seems to me that the cost of the material would be, you know, close to the, you know, 10, six to 10 grand. And that doesn't account for the labor. So I think what what I'm recommending is that we put that back in Newfield's lap, don't accept the credit for $2,000 and have them put a cap in, whether it's that precast cap that they did around the service wall there, but they should provide a cap, uh, a stone cap per the sketch and the drawings per PR, whatever PR number that was. So they bought something. So the question was whether or not the additional Mason contact you had provided the proposal that they said they were going to. That's going to be very, very high, much higher than the credit that we're going to get back. So Jeff, am I hearing you say you want to put it back to Newfield and they should install the cap that was originally there but rejected? Well, yeah, that, well, they should tell us what they bought and then install something that, that we would accept, whether it's a precast uh, unit like they did at the service area or some other stone. But uh, that's my recommendation to see if if uh, we can get Newfield to just finish, the, finish that part of the job. And it originally what was the specification to go there was for real stone, not not something precast. Am I real, am I right real. about that? Yes. So now we're saying they can put anything there. Well, I'm. I think I'm, I'm well, just a little. Con I want to make well, sure I'm understanding that right. Obviously, the two thousand dollar credit is not near enough for the sixty foot long, eighteen inch deep uh, cap. So what I found out is that it's it's significantly more. So whatever money was allocated to the sub. I don't know if it was enough or not, but that's not me, for me to talk about. The issue is that uh, we did sign off and we did pay for that wall already and the cap. And to re and I have not signed off on any credit yet for that cap. So I want to put it back in Newfield's lap to propose to us what they're recommending to do based on what they bought if they can't do the stone. That makes sense. 
sort of. Thank you for for trying to answer that. <laughs> Might just. I mean, be other, other, otherwise, you know, we're going to have to try to entertain an additional cost for a cap that should have been included in the first place. So. So Jeff, I'm a little confused. So you want us to bring the cap that we had on the job back, which was originally specified that has rust in it that you didn't like and install it. And that's what you're saying? No. Is there an alternate that you can do besides the rust? But that alternate is stones? not part of what the original PR states. Well, it was the, a capstone from the Fieldstone product that you wanted on the job. That's what we got on the job. You didn't like it because it had rust marks. That's not true. The sketch and the drawings did not show or say anything about including rust marks. In fact, this mason I had out there said that that's ridiculous. He wouldn't have brought that to the job in the first place. So um, for me, I think we should talk separately independent of this meeting and discuss how we can get a cap in there and what the options are yeah, based you on know, what you guys you paid go, for. Jeff, you can go spouting off at any point in time and then, then you want to take conversations when i try to defend our position and let's take that offline you know okay. it's got to stop can okay, i step Adam. in the air just for a second i think that we need to look at the difference between what was specified and what i think jeff is thinking about now and there, if there's a difference, I think there needs to be a fair adjustment. That's my position. So we'll meet offline with the, the review the specifications, Richard and Jeff. Um, yep. Scott yep. and I want to talk about this. And then also Brian and Steve, uh, we'd sent that additional markups on the, the, the value of what the cap is. If you could take a look at that on your end, um, yep. then we'll come together with those two data points. Great. The next item is the gym door ramp threshold. That's still scheduled for that June 22nd timeframe once school is out to replace that section of concrete. So there's no, no updates on that. It's still scheduled to, as it was before to resolve that threshold issue. Uh, the doors, uh, there was some chipping reported around the building. Um, if I recall, and Richard and Jeff, uh, let me know, but I don't believe there was any chipping identified when we were doing all the punch list walkthroughs. We did do a walk um, last week, and both with Newfield and with TSKP and, and Randy. Um, the lion's share of the chipping items appear to be at locations where there was door stops. In fact, a couple of them were at actively used door stops while we were walking through. Um, so that appears to be the, the, the cause of why there was some of the delamination between the, the, the veneer and the whole uh, the core of the door at the bottom of the doors. Uh, and then, Chris, has, Chris has a question. Uh, Adam, so what's the, what do we do? We're going to let them continue to chip or we're going to put some kind of kick plate there or I mean a well, doorstop we, should make a, a door delaminate. Well, actually, it, it does because the, the, the shape, it's a piece of triangle, a piece of wood. And when you wedge that on there and you move the door, the closest thing to that wedge is the veneer of the door. So it's very clear that that's what was happening. The recommendation I discussed with Adam would be to put an L-shaped uh, angle piece at the bottom edge of that door and fasten it through so that if they are using door wedges, which they shouldn't be doing because there's closes on these doors, um, that, uh, that that could be an option. So we're talking about uh, some shop-made door wedges, not rubberized door wedges. Well, they really That's shouldn't probably be. Probably for, for move-in, probably, yeah. right? Well, effectively, it would be, um, what, what Jeff is talking about is not an additional door wedge. It would be some sort of angle trim piece or something at the bottom of every door in the building and installing right. that to reinforce it. Because the kick, actually there was a chip beneath one of the doors that had a kick plate because the kick plate sits up a quarter inch or a half inch above the bottom of the door. And even that door had a chip on the bottom of it where it looked like it got propped open. So- no I, I, no, I understand the difference. I'm just saying, would that be likely to have happened because of move-in stuff where you had to prop the doors open and move boxes of materials in and furniture? Um, it could have been part of move in. I know there was door stops being used while we were walking through with classrooms in session. So it was well after the movers. So it's not 
just uh, there was one door that appeared to be damaged right after the big move and that we could attribute to the movers. Um, and we're, we're working on that um, door replacement edit, but otherwise in terms of there being a timeline or addressing it to the movers or, you know, the, some other, you know, the cleaners, the, the whomever, there wasn't a correlation between one event and the chipping starting. So what would the cost be for that angled piece to put on the bottom of the doors? Uh, we don't have a quote for that yet. Um, Jeff and I were still just sort of spitballing about what that might look like, but not de minimis if they were doing it at every single door throughout the building. Well, Adam, isn't this something that Bill and his team could just do at, you know, start locally at the ones that are being done? Because I think a lot of the classrooms, the teachers aren't using, they're not propping up the doors. So I just, I think we saw a handful of doors that had that, like the art classroom and a few in the lower B wing, right? There might be one or two on the upstairs, but I don't know that we need to just do every door unless, you know, that could be something that Bill could handle piecemeal with just uh, from a Granger catalog or a McMaster car, just get a couple of strips of aluminum, you know, eighth inch uh, and just screw it, fasten them in through the door with countersunk you know, wood screws and be done with it. But really they shouldn't be using the door stops because the whole net zero thing is that we're, we're balancing the mechanical system. So, so we know it's going to happen. It's going to happen, but that's why I'm saying, I don't know that our team or anybody on our end really should be, you know, having somebody do this on our end. I think it should be something that Bill and the town should probably be taking care of. Jeff, I think you just answered the question I'm about to ask, but are the doors able to stay open or are they automatically close because of the heating and cooling? Yes. They automatically close. So if a person wanted their door, their classroom door open because there was a lot of traffic coming in and out for whatever reason, their only solution would be to prop it. Or have somebody hold the door open until the last okay. person exits out. Right. Right. Okay. Thanks. So just wanted to clarify, um, while I don't doubt that there are some of the old wooden shop made uh, door wedges, there's a variety of manufactured door wedges that uh, teachers are using. We know that this is kind of a growing edge of a net zero building and we, we want to discourage the use, but um, the doors are, are kind of tricky for some, some of our smaller kids uh, and there's a lot of traffic and so it's helpful. Uh, I, I believe uh, Bill and I were talking about it, and I think that there's some adjustments on some of the doors that uh, if you kind of hyper extend and open, there's an option of having the door stay open without using a door wedge. And so we'll continue to work with that, but I do think it, it, it can be a facilities, it seems to be very localized to a handful of doors, and we'll work with teachers. We want to be able to support their needs and the needs of the kids, give them that option. Um, a lot of it is just getting used to a climate controlled environment. It's not unlike the fact that we have those windows that can be opened as well. And so over time, we'll, we'll work on that, uh, building that kind of um, culture uh, and understanding uh, with the net zero piece and balance that with what's practical and, and best for kids. Okay. And, uh... Are there other items, Adam? Playground. Uh, yeah, the, the ones that are, are closed um, since we last met, um, the debris around the building, Newfield did another visual and, uh, and magnetic sweep um, and picked up a, a bunch of debris and removed that. So that occurred uh, shortly after our OAC. I'm sorry, after our last SBC meeting. Uh, the door locks where there was an exterior FOB access issue um, that was resolved uh, on, uh, with Bill Treach uh, on June 1st with the manufacturer. Um, the, uh, the screws issue that uh, was in one of the classrooms that Rich had reported, um, we, we talked with the, uh, um, with the teacher and, and Steve and Ben with Newfield had already been out there and resolved that issue with that, uh, with that classroom. So there wasn't screws coming out, it was just some of the covers for some of the screws, not the screws themselves. So that got resolved. Uh, the kitchen freezer sprinkler. Um, there was Adam. The, excuse me, I missed the key word on the classroom for the screws. What was the issue? It was the the 
the plug, the little wood aesthetic plug came off of a couple of them, um, not the screws popping out themselves. It was just a little, you have wood panel and then you put a little plug on it so you don't see the screw head. That's the- Oh, up in the uh, ceiling. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the kitchen freezer sprinkler um, that had some condensation because it didn't have enough insulation. So the sprinkler uh, subcontractor came back out, cleared the ice and added the additional insulation to stop that issue. And then the, uh, as of today, uh, the playgrounds, um, the last component that had some yellow tape on there with uh, some of the footings that needed to cure, um, that was cleared uh, as, as being resolved with the other nuts and bolts and replacement parts having been resolved last week by uh, Newfield on the installers. Um, and as of today, the town um, playground uh, inspection consultant had made another site visit uh, early this afternoon, reviewed the work and didn't see any issues with what the, with all the, uh, the issues that were resolved. So um, obviously there's still the rubberized surfacing that's getting installed over the summer once school is out. Um, but otherwise, the uh, all the issues that were observed at the playground have been resolved. Steve, question? Any yeah, questions? not so much a issue, but just curious. Do we know what color of the rubberized what color the rubberized surface will be once it's installed? That's a good I only question. ask because yeah. I'm wondering, you know, if it, if it can imagine it's going to be black like a, like the black top, but how hot it's going to get. Honestly, I don't remember. I think the uh, material was specified by Richter and Segan, and, and there may have been a sample submitted at some point, Jeff, unless you remember. I mean, typically it's not black. It's, it's some sort of neutral, sometimes a color, some sort of a speckled finish sometimes. Um, uh, Jeff, I don't know if you recall. I'm looking them up now. I know there's a couple of different colors there, and I believe they're sort of more uh, greens, uh, nothing black like asphalt, definitely not. So um, it's to complement the playground equipment colors and the, and the um, you know, the nature around it. So I can pull that up here while we're still talking, see if I can find it here. Okay, thank you. Like Tony had a question and then Rich. And does this mean that the playgrounds are now open? Yes. Like a Peter question. <laughs> Uh, yes, we opened them up uh, on Monday. That's very good news. Thank you. Uh, Rich? Uh, not really a question, but an observation or um, uh, maybe a request. Um, we are noticing that there is no shade on the playground. And I don't know where how we go about providing shade, but it would be nice if there were some shade built into that playground somewhere, it, it, especially with the weather getting warmer. Um, we have children who are cowering under the benches because it, it's been hot on some days. And I don't know if that's a building committee thing or whether that's something that we need to, uh, you know, the school system needs to think about, but um, it is a very hot and very sunny uh, playground. Can I, so I can make a comment on that. And and there will be other things that come up. So we should talk about what's the best method of adding features now that we're not part of the project, but um, the committee would like to add. Um, so in this kind of item, which is a playground enhancement, it could be uh, a shade that is installed. These are pre-manufactured devices that you can have uh, a uh, playground installer install. Uh, I'm, I'm reluctant to continue to add change orders um, because we do need to uh, end with change orders sooner rather than later. Uh, otherwise, we'll never get to the end zone. And so when these kinds of things come up, I would encourage thinking about getting another vendor in who could do this. The cost Correct me if I'm wrong, Colliers, but I believe the cost still would be eligible for reimbursement, even though it's being done outside uh, Newfield's contract. That, uh, I wouldn't say that's necessarily the case, given it's a different addition to the playground that wasn't in the original playground drawings that were approved by OSCGR. And they may very well like take the stance that this is, this is effectively a separate project rather than just a, a change to an existing project. Now that we're past substantial completion, then um, it's 
I wouldn't say it's a shoe in. Scott, do you have any addition? To that? I, I agree. I think that's a that's a very good statement, um, Adam. Yeah, I, I I don't believe if it wasn't in the ed spec or wasn't approved, on you know as as a component of the project previously, you might be able to resubmit it, but it, it would be resubmitting it very very late in the game, and you know we can't uh, comment on what way they may or may not approve. But I think it would be a reach. Peter. I, I do th think that uh, a couple of things. One, um, I think this is on the district. Uh, two, I think uh, a game changer will be when we open up the field. Um, that allows students to move out onto the grass, which completely changes. And uh, our playscapes at Goodwin and Vinton did not have shade, although there were shade around the perimeter. And we'll continue to see that as we can move out onto uh, the field area. And if while we're waiting for some of those trees to mature, we could certainly look at uh, some shade station and uh, picnic tables with umbrellas and things like that. Thanks, Steve. I'll certainly defer to the superintendent on if we need the structures or not, but my comment was going to be if we are going to in install some type of shade structure type stuff, or if the, if the district does, um, I think it'd be very beneficial to do that before we do the port in place surface so that we don't have to cut it to excavate for the footers for whatever is holding that up. Uh, I think the only place that I would uh, foresee that being a challenge and where I'd want to do that is in the pre-K kindergarten area. That's a pretty tight, very sunny, hot area. Uh, I think that we have plenty of re real estate and we haven't even opened up the trike path. Uh, area which will extend the playground area and some of that area is shaded as well. So I do think over time we're going to see that as we expand our campus we'll correct this um, but great point appreciate it Tony. All right some of the discussions that the downtown partnership has had about bringing shade structures onto the square and I really would caution you they can be extraordinarily expensive. Uh, Chris McNabo. Um, There's other things besides say shade structures you can get um, and just to see if you need it, those um, fabric like um, fly materials that can be secured very well with wire uh, to fencing and other uh, fixed positions already on the playground that don't require any digging at all if, it, if it's something that you want to just temporarily check out. Okay, so, all right, thanks for raising that issue, Rich. Um, get under advisement. <laughs> was there anything else, Adam, that kind of goes through the list? That was, uh, that was the end of the list. Okay. Yeah. Right. I don't know, uh, I wanna to go too far down a rabbit hole here. I wanna, I guess, so any responses to the question I have, we can kind of, I guess, just keep it a superficial level in the interest of time, but, um, Peter and I and certain others, you know, we've been a part now of several calls uh, with state uh, public health officials talking about um, the copper issues. And I know the district put out a communication in the last day or two, just based on the, the latest rounds of sampling and just acknowledging that we continue to have issues with the, the copper piping in the building and, and uh, copper uh, concentrations in the, in the water um, now being above the the sort of the action level and, and kind of creating an, an exceedance that uh, needs to be addressed. So I guess my question is, um, as we grapple with this and we continue to, you know, work with our state partners and everybody involved to figure out kind of what the, what the long-term solution is going to be. And, and again, just continue to wrap our heads around the issue. One, one question I guess I have that maybe I misunderstood some of the stuff that was said previously, but when it comes to the piping and the copper piping in the building, it was suggested uh, by by public health officials that um, that the material, the copper, the cho choice to use copper, uh, basically to plumb the building, that 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 basically could have been essentially driven by the state, uh, the school construction grants office. That alternative materials, um, you know, might not have been. 
approved or been eligible for you know the same level of reimbursement or whatever the case may be. So I guess again, without getting too far into the the whole water issue, the copper, I guess I'm just looking hopefully for a simple answer. What drove that decision? Was that a our design decision? Uh, is that something that the state office school construction would have in fact required? Ryan, I'm not aware of the state mandating copper piping be part of school construction. Uh, what I can offer is uh, I'm reaching out to Colorona and, and see what, who made the decision on copper and, and where that came from. I'll have to get back to you. Okay, I'll definitely be interested in knowing the answer. Thank you. Sorry, buddy. I got another uh, design review meeting tonight with the town, so I got to leave now. All right, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, any other items for uh, any anyone, <laughs> Adam or anybody else? Yeah, if I may. Oh, go ahead, Richard. Yes, okay, thank you. Just to uh, remind everybody that you have retainage on this project and the last requisition that I saw uh, from Newfield indicates that you're still holding um, a fair amount of money to finish uh, open items as well as retainage totaling uh, 1.679 million plus. Um, at some point, I expect Newfield is going to want to reduce that number of retainage as they complete items. I had some communication with Ben Chase from Newfield about the state of the punch list items that I know Newfield has been finishing as they've been uh, working on the project. And so uh, in, back in February, when we issued the certificate of substantial completion, uh, or when we issued the punch list, which I believe is dated February, that accompanied the certificate. And when you got the certificate of occupancy by the building official, at that time, we placed a value by consensus with Newfield a value of $639,262 for open punch list items. Um, more recently, based with Ben Chase's help, it looks like uh, that number has been reduced to 220,000 in open punch list items. Um, and so that, that number will dwindle. And I think that at some point, we're gonna be looking for release of retainage and release of um, some of the funds. Um, and so you should be expecting a requisition sometime in the near future for that to happen. Um, and then we'll continue and then we'll look at what other items still need to be done uh, before we get to final completion. And final completion will be the last requisition for payment to be issued by Newfield. I don't have a date for that. I'm not sure if Newfield has a date for that application for final completion, but I can see one major payment and then the final payment. I mean, Newfield, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but that's the way I'm seeing it. Yeah, Richard, we're kind of in, a, we're in agreement with that track. I think it's important that our sending a team out there to validate our punch list completion so you can knock this off because that's only our assessment. We say we're done to a value of 200 something thousand. You need to tell us that we're good with that. And at that point, we'll move it to the next step. I think the big are really going to be happening a um, few weeks to a month, and that's the playground rework the paving rework type of items of which that the town's got a bond on, um, which were also, I'll call it double indemnity. You have it included in your value, but the town also has it. So I think we're getting close to a point where come to that one more requisition and then a final. Okay, so if you can give me some sense of when that might be, we can schedule a time to to walk through. I can have my consultants also do another walkthrough. I thought that I thought that was already being scheduled. Did I miss something? 
I, I'm not aware of a date. Yeah, we'll, we'll accept any date. I would assume it probably probably after the kids come out. Be best. Oh, so we can, okay, at the beginning of the summer session. Yeah, I think that would be the best for the school and everybody to have okay. a bunch of people crawling around the building when we do it after they leave. But I think it best maybe when they leave. The best in the what? Best when they get out, which is in another week or two. Okay. All right. We'll schedule a date. Thank you. All right. Yep. Um, I just have one more question about acoustics. Adam, you had mentioned before the um, email that had just come in and looking at the acoustics in the cafeteria, which we all know are um, in need of some fixes. Um, I did have someone question me the other day about the audiologist that was brought in to assess acoustic levels throughout the building. And so I didn't know if anything was being looked at in places other than the CAF or just in the cafeteria at this point. I just want a point of order. An audiologist was not brought in. Oh, okay. We can track. Uh, with an audiologist who happened to be in the building supporting other students. Uh, this is a, uh, a family member in our community and uh, helped us better understand technology that the building committee supported with yes. that. But she, she was not officially brought in to assess our, our building. Good. Good to know. Thank you. Um, okay, then I think let's move on. Um, well, that oh, was a, sorry, go that was a good question. No. And what is happening with the sound issues? I know uh, there was a discussion earlier about the nature of the paint, but um, is that the only only response? So the system that um, uh, the building committee supported will be in all of our classrooms. That's a a, a pretty hefty lift to get that technology up and running and to train all the staff members. So we're still rolling that out. Um, but that system we anticipate will help offset um, any of the challenges of the room, coupled with uh, some of the corrections with thermostats and, and odd noises here and there. Uh, and so I think over time we'll mitigate uh, and, and help address those localized um, challenges with sound. Okay, um, so then uh, Adam for the procurement review and approval, the only thing in there was a, that CCD. Right, right. that was the CCD we discussed earlier. So that was just in there for reference. There's nothing up for review or a vote tonight for PCOs or procurement. Okay. All right, so then the next item on our agenda is an executive session. So Mary, you wanna make a motion? I would like to make a motion that we move into executive session pursuant to Connecticut General Statute section 1-206 and section 1-210B for discussion of contract revisions due to project delays and discussions of pending claims. And I would like to move that we invite Superintendent Dart, Town Manager Aylesworth, Project Managers, Ad, excuse me, Adam Levitis and Scott Pellman to join us. Okay, so there's a motion. I'll second. Second. Okay, second from Chris Kiefner. <laughs> uh, then all in favor, please indicate. Okay, so then we're going to go into executive. Thanks. Uh, then we'll go into executive session. Um, so um, anybody that's not invited in can either leave the meeting or we'll get put you into a, a waiting room this time. Ray and Steve, are you going to be coming out of executive executive session for any further discussion, or are you just going to come out? I'm not anticipating that. All right, good enough. Thank you. Good night, everybody. We would need uh, so we've left executive session at five thirty-five, and I would accept a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Tony. Is there a second? Uh, Mary, all in favor? Can indicate. And with that, and then we are complete. And thank you all. Hi, everyone. Hi. I know.